Good afternoon. So today we're going to do something different. Uh, one of the things that we've learned at Y Combinator is that one of the best ways to learn about startups is to watch other startups get advice. Um, and so we're going to do live office hours, which we've done a few times before in this class, three or four times. Uh, we'll try to do three companies each time. This is Yuri, also works at Y Combinator, uh, and going to do this with me. And we're going to just give advice to three startups. You have to be very brave to do this. So I'm very thankful for the startups that have agreed to do this. Uh, these are some of the people that are taking the course online. Um, and we'll just get going. Uh, so do you want to tell us? Well, first, you want to introduce yourselves? Does this work? Oh. So I'm Sarah, and this is my co-founder, Andrew. Um, we're building Canny. Uh, Canny helps teams collect and manage feedback from their users. Um, essentially, what it is is teams can integrate our product into their website or mobile app, and that allows their users to post and vote on feedback. Is it live? It yes. Live. And how, so, many, oh, how many websites uh, have integrated? Yeah, um, we launched our MVP about a month ago on Product Hunt, um, and that was pretty good traffic. Um, we have uh, 25 paying customers, so those are people who have um, either integrated or using us in a certain way. Um, but yeah, we got maybe around 500 companies from the Product Hunt launch. That's great. Yeah. How much are you charging? Um, it's a range. So um, on the low end, we have like a $2 plan, which was our, our alternative to freemium. Um, GPM. And, uh, and it goes from 1949, 129 from there. Um, and we're really, it's really early, and we're trying to iterate on this and figure out what our best price point is, which is probably one of our main challenges right now, I think. Is, oh, go ahead. No, no. How'd you even arrive at the first set of numbers to test? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The two dollar one was kind of special. We were flip flopping between freemium and GPM. And I think that was a good decision because it narrowed down um, our potential customers by a lot. And um, we figured that people who are not going to pay us anything. We're never going to pay us anything. Um, How many of the 25 customers are on the $2 plan? Um, maybe seven. Yeah. That's a good Really? Seven. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, and what's the other most popular plan? It's at 19? 19. 19. Um, we limited our $2 plan very heavily. So it's really people who like are a solo founder, you probably no revenue. Yeah. How do you decide, what, what do you get with the pricing? I think I looked at your website, it's how many users you have? Right, so right now we're charging by how many end users you have. Um, that was kind of our proxy to how much value the company was going to get from our product. Um, this is kind of a challenge, um, especially because we can't particularly tell how many users they have. Um, so we're iterating on this as well. What do people really love about this? Why do, why do they use your product and not one of the many other services to accomplish the same goal? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different values that you get out of posting and voting on features. One of them is, you know, you you have a there's a lot of transparency, so you keep your users in the loop. Um, a lot of current feedback solutions is like email or live chat, where you you the user sends an email and then the company says, oh, we'll pass it on to the team, is what inevitably happens, and then uh, the user doesn't really know, like, did my voice get heard. And so we've heard both from teams and users that this is a great experience. Their users are happy. They know what feedback their users are giving versus email and live chat, which takes just a ton of time to process all these conversations. Of the people that are using it, what's, kinda the, what's the average number of questions that have been posted on it so far? Average number of questions? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so people pro or requests or something else that they're voting on. Like, Do you know of, of the 25 paying customers, how many on average have had questions posted? It really depends on how many end users they have, and right. also how um, well they've implemented um, our tools. Like, if it's less discoverable, they're going to get less feedback. And so we've been trying to um, help that by giving them design advice. Um, but um, like our top team probably has three hundred posts. Um, and the thing about e this versus email is that you might get, you know, th if a post has a hundred votes, you might get a hundred different emails. Right. And so we help you like save time by responding to all those 100 people at once instead of like sending um, individual emails back and forth. Do, do you feel like you've gotten to the point where you have a product that some people really love? And at this point, um, if so, well, I guess, do you, do you think you're at that point first? Yeah, I feel like we have a sliver of product market fit where some people are extremely happy with our product. And we kind of know the next steps we need to do to expand that by 10x to you know address a larger portion of the market. What are the steps? Uh, integrations with other SaaS services so like Intercom, Slap, Z uh, Slack, Zapier, and then uh, a better uh, answer on mobile. Is that the biggest? Is the biggest challenge you face now just figuring out how to grow and scale this? Do you think, or is there still a lot of product work? 
uh, other than sort of like integrations that are meant to drive growth, is there still a lot of product work before you really want to scale? There's, a, there's some product work for sure. I think the core product is pretty good, but it takes a while for our, our leads to get stuck on our product because they have to integrate into their product, so it's a pretty big investment. How easy is it to integrate again? It's pretty easy. It's, it's like really easy. You know, it takes half an hour to an hour is what we see developers spending time on. But uh, it's just, I think we need better onboarding to convince them that this is worth doing. And so like, I think right now our funnel is pretty leaky. Hmm. Um, so that's what we're well, working on. What's the biggest onboarding. value? That, so your biggest user has a, 300 questions? Or a couple Post. hundred questions. Post. Several hundred. Right. And so what's the biggest value that they see out of it? What do they tell you? Yeah, it's hard because a lot of like our, our value add is very diverse. Like one thing is customer satisfaction. Another thing is product management. You know what you want to work on. Another thing is having a transparent roadmap, so keeping your users in the loop. And there's just all these different kind of values. There isn't one core value, which is also why it's kind of hard to that sounds like a mistake. A mistake. Uh, almost everyone who says, "Oh, we have all these different values," and, you know, like there's all these different reasons people like it. It's really nice if you can figure out how that all abstracts into one message, and then build all of the company's sales and marketing and PR around one this message. Is core the, value. Product. This is what it's about, uh, right. rather than saying, "Oh, there's like six different reasons to use the product." I think one of the things that like so, so when you say you have a problem with people integrating you. It's not that hard. It's just not high enough on their priority list. And there's a few ways to solve this. One thing that works is to send people around and say like, hey, we're going to send an engineer to come help integrate with you. And it's not that the company can't do it. It's just that like, you otherwise you'll always be at the bottom of their backlog. Right. And that's one way. The other is if it's like their CEO tells them to go do it. Um, or like right. they themselves <laughs> decide, I got to go do this. It's really important. And that almost never comes from a bunch of disparate messages that are a bunch of nice to haves. It's like one thing, which is maybe in this case, like, um, I mean, it's, it's some version of like user feedback and how if you don't have this, you will be iterating more slowly than your competitors. Or that um, your users will feel like you're more engaged with them, if listening to the features that they want built. I have two big questions. Um, one, I, I think back of the envelope math is always really important. And I think I worry that this is the kind of business where if you're mostly selling to startups and you're selling it, let's say, on average 100 bucks, is it a month or a year? A month. A month. Um, like, how big can this business actually get off of this model? Have you, have you thought about that? We have thought about it. Um, I mean, I think like just doing napkin math. I think with a startup, you usually want to arrive somewhere around 100 million annual revenue. And so for us, like right now, it's looking like we'd be going for 10,000 people paying us $100 a month. Um, and does that feel doable? Or maybe it's 100,000. Uh, yeah. So there's a difference there. Yeah. I mean, I think the number. I think of, it is 100,000 for 100. Yeah, 100,000. Sorry. Um, I think the number of companies that need feedback and the number of websites and mobile apps is increasing. And, but do you feel do you feel there's a hundred thousand? So part of it is like, or do you feel you're going to have to own like fifty percent of the startup market to get there, or do you think uh, there's enough demand out there that you can actually get to the market without being the you know dominating the entire thing? Right. Right. I think. Um as, a, as an aside to this, I think we can, uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback that we can actually charge a lot more. And so um, I think there's a few features that we can build out that will help a lot. Including, Do you like, use analytics. your own product? Do you have yeah. a, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, that's a good way to figure out if it's providing value. Again, maybe the answer is to charge a yeah. lot more. Maybe yeah. the answer is that there are 100,000 startups. Maybe mm -hmm. the answer is you need to tweak the product in a way that you can appeal to a lot of people outside of right. startups. But I think startups almost never just do the swag on this early mm -hmm. enough, and it really informs product strategy, right. which also gets to my next big question. Um, this feels like the kind of service that uh, is interchangeable and that a lot of people can build a similar service, and if one company uses product A and another company uses product B, mm -hmm. there's no reason for a third company to prefer A or B. There's no network effect. There's no monopoly. Um, now, I can imagine ways that you could build one of those into the product. Uh, where there, there are sort of cross-company cross, cross company incentives to use yours. But what is your plan to be a monopoly and not another SaaS business that just gets competed down to zero margins? That's a good question. Um, 
I think... And if you don't have an answer yet, yeah. it's also fine to just I mean, I think, really like, our strategy so far is um, to go after influencers, and um, these are including people who um, have users that would also use our product. Um, so, for example, we go after um, open source projects and, um, you know, uh, tools like Optimizely, for example. You give it free to open source projects? Open source projects are free. Um, yeah. As an alternative to GitHub and GitHub issues, I think, um, and they're bringing us in a lot of people, I think that's a, that's a, a good move for us. Um, but so far, I think our strategy is really to, you know, put our product in front of the public. Um, you know, it's powered by Canny, um, and that's, yeah, kind of where we're at with that. So, do you have any thoughts about this? Um, one little thought. I mean, I think one thing that we've found so far is that there are other products in the market that do this. And during our product hunt launch, we got people coming from those products wanting to use us. And the thing that they mentioned liking about us more is design and simplicity. And I honestly feel like our product out of all the products in the market right now is the best designed and the simplest I for exactly you. what we do. I believe you that that's true, but here's the problem. Every startup, I'd say like one out of three startups I meet with says like, we're like this other thing, except we're better designed, we're more beautiful, and we're simpler to use. And it may be true that you are, I believe that it is, but someone else can come do that same thing to you. More importantly, or not necessarily more importantly, but oftentimes you start off very simple and then you start having to build features because you see that they're missing and then somebody else comes in and says, we're, we're now the simplest. But, but, but in any case, like, to, to, it's really good. You know, you've, done, you've built a product that people love, you've got them to pay for it, and you, you have a growth channel you believe will work. That puts you in the top like few percent of all startups, so that's great. But this is the time where your biggest problem now um, part of that, you know, when the one thing you should be thinking about is what can I do early to build a product that A, can eventually address a very large market, and B, how can I build some sort of monopoly? Um, how, can I, how can I build something where, because this company uses my product, this other company is going to be more likely to use it as well? Mm -hmm. And design and simplicity, although everyone says it, and it's kind of true, is, is usually not a long-term win. At some point, um, and it may just be that you know once you're integrated into a company, you're impossible to rip out, and then you're going to win the mindshare war. Right. That could be it. I think that's what we're seeing, actually. Yeah. A better answer, though, would be if if there's some way that you can like use aggregated data or learnings across all companies, uh -huh. um, or aggregate, you know, like share like users. The kind of users that leave feedback on products tend to do it across all the products yes. they build, mm -hmm. they use. So there's probably like a very small percentage of users that give feedback and they do it across all the products. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that somewhere in there, there is a strategy to build a, a monopoly, but mm -hmm. you want to figure out what that core is and make that the, build that into like the, the core of the product right. so that y you have a long-term defensible yeah. strategy. Um, this is actually really interesting because we probably started at more of an aggregate level. Um, where everyone could post feedback about anything. Um, and that was hard because companies weren't on board first. And so... Yeah, that doesn't feel right either. Yeah. So right now, we've decided to go this other way for now. But, um, you know, there is a possibility that this is um, there. One day, we're connecting all the users. If they post on multiple, you know, products that um, that use Canny, um, we can connect all those people. So maybe there's some potential there eventually, yeah. And why is it named Canny? <laughs> Kenny was really hard to find. Um, we went through many different uh, names, but um, a core part of our product is the subdomain. And we didn't want to use something that was like, get this or try this, um, use this. Yeah. Um, short and sweet. Yeah, so something short and sweet. Um, we got Kenny.io, so it's not the worst, but it's not it's not the best. You can still change. It's not yes, too late. Yes, we can still change. I thought it was a um, play on uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they're kind of different, but I, yeah. I think, yeah, it means to make good judgment. And so I think that kind of plays in as well. Yeah. But okay. it's, it's, yeah. If, if it's working, if people remember it, if they spell <laughs> yeah. it right, it's all good. Um, anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, in general, I think, um, to your point about uh, broad use cases, um, after our product hunt launch, it came out with a lot of people using candy for different way reasons. And so I think... Is there one reason like that's focusing surfacing? On, yeah, so I mean, uh, the feature top requests. one is feature requests, right. um, which is what we expected. Um, but also I think pricing is one of the big ones, like figuring out what our main value is. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, isolate that one thing to ex especially like market it on our, on our homepage. How do we pull people in with that one value? Yeah. Feature requests don't sound quite as good as like user engage. I, I, I don't know. I'm not like I would be willing to 
this is the place where I believe in A-B testing. I don't believe in it for everything, but in terms of messaging and communication, and what are those four words you put big on your website when people yes. come there for the first time, this is a place I believe in A-B testing. And if feature requests are really what people want, then great. Yeah, I mean, and if that's right up front. If that's the thing that's yeah. working, you should at least, that's at least a candidate for the right, right answer. Right. Cool. All right, we should move on okay. to the next group. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, guys. Hey, oh, I'm Sam. Chris. Hey, hey Yuri. Chris. How's it going? By the way, I don't know what any of these companies do ahead of time. <laughs> a live reaction for me. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Beltran. I'm the CEO and uh, founder of Tummel. What we do is we connect um, homeowners, private property owners, and all sorts of par uh, parking lot owners um, to our app. And what our app does is it aggregates uh, essentially their parking spaces, lets them lease it out. The owners are able to make some passive income. And the parkers are able to just go to that parking spot whenever they want to, easily and quickly. So this tool was uh, meant for specifically San Francisco, uh, highly industrialized cities in which um, people need to park easier and faster rather than circling the block. It's like Airbnb minutes, for parking. Essentially, yes, it is. Yeah, I've wanted to see something like this happen for a long time because it feels like in, the, in urban cities like San Francisco, there's just not enough street parking. <laughs> that is, um, but right now it is... More of the issue is this is a perceptive problem, right? Or is this an actual problem? So, and are are you live in the city right now? We are not live in the city. We're currently building out the MVP right now. Got it. So, unfortunately, my co-founder is not here. She's actually taking a vacation through Mexico. I think she's doing some <laughs> traveling. So, um, mind you, it's, I'm not a solo founder. I do have a co-founder. Right. Well. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so, where are you, have you been talking to homeowners in the meantime? Are they willing to rent out their parking spots? You know what? Uh, the funny thing is, I am actually hitting the ground running, and I'm physically going out to these homes and our private par parking lots, and you know, pitching to them my idea and saying, "Hey, why don't you use our platform? This is what it's going to look like." And I'm representing our mockups <laughs> to essentially say, "This is the the platform that you would essentially be using." And what do they tell you? More often than not, they say, this is awesome. Why haven't anybody else created this? Are they willing to say, hey, I'm like ready to pay? Like, or would they pay you? No, you would pay them to, like you would do a rough share with them, right? Correct. So yeah. essentially, um, the percentage of sales that uh, occur when the um, commuter parks in their parking space right. will collect 15%. They collect 85%. So can you sign them up? I mean, part of the thing for you is that when you launch in a city, you're going to want as much critical mass as you Correct. want for a parking spot. So yeah. are they willing to sign up and say, hey, my parking spot is yours the moment you're ready? Currently, uh, what we're doing is we're creating the list and we're pitching the idea to them. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to curate all these uh, homeowners and private property owners throughout San Francisco that apply to, uh, oh, pretty much that play with San Francisco standards because you cannot park um, or impede over onto right. the sidewalk. So obviously there's some... There's some things that we have to do to double check to make sure that they are completely legal. Sure. Um, but otherwise, what we're doing is we're collecting data from them. And yes, they are more than willing to sign up with us. When do you think you'll launch? Um, I pretty much projected to launch within six months. And why so, why so long? Yeah. Why so long? Um, About six days. I would love to pitch it in. Uh, I would love to build this out in six days. But currently, I'm not a technical founder. So that was, uh, or a technical person. Is your co-founder? My co-founder is technical. Okay. So she. Um, has the tools and resources and clout to build this, essentially. But she's on vacation, where she was here. <laughs> when is she back? Um, she should be back um, within the week. Is she full six days after that? I know, I know. Um, I would love to look, push this. One of the things that's really hard is uh, <laughs> no one ever wants, like you're putting like this product of yourself out there when you launch a startup, and no one wants to do it until they feel like it's really good. Um, but in six months, the world will look entirely different, and every good idea you have, someone else has. And now a lot of people are going to hear about this because we're talking about it. You know, uh, <laughs> don't steal my idea, of all of you. Don't steal it. <laughs> I mean, stealing the idea. So, not, so yeah. it's it's like NDAs for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> speed and execution really matter, and it actually, you know, you could tell ten million people the idea, and probably all of them would be busy with their own things, but um, a few of them will be interested at least. And and there's this issue of speed and how quickly you can build and iterate. And especially in a marketplace, um, there is a big first mover advantage. So even if it's not the version you want, my, my most important piece of advice to you would be to get this launched really quickly um, in an ugly first version. And then you'll learn so much about how to build a better version that you can go from there. It's great that you're talking to customers. That is clearly the number one thing to go do. And getting people signed up so that you have inventory. 
But I would think about how you bring bring the the launch in, even if it's a soft launch that you're embarrassed about by a lot. If the, um, yeah, especially if the problem is acute enough, like if it's something that people really struggle with, which finding parking spots, they won't care how pretty the app is or how ugly the app is, as long as they can find the parking spots. So having something live, even if it's just like a website wrapped in, in a little icon, you know, yeah. it's like if that's, yeah. that's literally what we're doing is we're targeting certain neighborhoods. So. For instance, um, there's neighborhood. I, I'm sure you've been to San Francisco multiple times. I live there. Yeah. Uh, you live there, obviously. Um, Pate District is one of them, yeah, right. which is com severely impacted nine times out of ten, dur even during the week. How do you know? Is, well, I've been there physically and had a checkboard out and checking the times and stand there for eight hours a day. Um, but there are times where it does free up a little bit. <laughs> but for so, the most so part, I understand how you're going to get the parking places on board, um, which is, I think, the harder half of the marketplace. But you still need people that want to park. Correct. How are correct. you going to get those people? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to people during festivals. Um, you know, there's tons of festivals. There's outside lands. There's uh, some that go on on Treasure Island, even though they know that's out of our reach. Um, but there's many that happen around Golden Gate Park. There's, um, you know, uh, Beta Breakers. There's tons of festivals that we're going to be pitching this around or some type of theme or, or some type of festival, some type of ball game. I worry that those, A, don't happen frequently enough, and B, those are people who are not looking for parking super regularly in the city. It would be interesting if you could figure out a way to find people who, for whom this is like truly a hair on fire problem that drive to the city every day and have to park and or live in the city and don't have a parking place. Like that does not strike me as the most urgent need or the mo the best way to find people who are really feeling this problem every day. Which there are a lot of. This is a this is a great problem to be solving. Um, I would think about how you find. I would think about other strategies to find a lot of people. Um, the festival thing, they're, they're, I just I worry there aren't enough festivals and there aren't enough people at those that have this as a regular ongoing problem. You want, you want the people who are going to be daily or at least weekly users of this, and I bet you can come up with better ways. Well, I think if you're feet on the ground and actually surveying the place, I would actually ask the people who are parking, why are you here? That's exactly what I'm doing. And see, what, uh, so what's the feedback? Like, is so, there, are they um, working there? So nine times out of 10, uh, people are either commuting into the city, so there are people that are not living in the city, obviously, because a lot of people who live right. in the city don't necessarily own a car. Right. Um, so but they're commuting for what? Are they commuting for they're work? They're commuting for work, and sometimes they're just commuting to do some contract work. they got to come into the city. Every so often, there's, there's people that come in for meetings. Um, a whole host of reasons that they come in. I mean, these people are driving today and parking today. Maybe they'll do it more if it's easier. But can you put like signs in the parking lot, in the parking spaces that say to park here, download this? Yeah, essentially just... That'll work. <laughs> so when that when that time comes in which we do have a product launch, I'm going to create, you know, like maybe little signs at first. Something cheap just to get started. Um, you know, maybe laminated or whatnot to put it on those places where it needs to be. Right. So you need it's something because it, it, in a lot of cases sign. it is an impulse buy. Right. They are going to be looking for parking. They didn't find the street parking, and now they're ready to buy whatever it is that you're giving them. Yeah. I have a general thought for you about this kind of marketplace. Um, Airbnb is a really good business because if you own a space and you're renting it out, you can only put it on basically one platform. If you're going to use the instant book feature, and if you are, uh, if you're a guest, you really care if you get this particular house or this particular house. They're not interchangeable. Um, ride sharing, um, if you're a driver, you can drive for any service. You turn the apps on and off. And if you're a passenger, you don't care w much which car you get in. And it's really nice if you can somehow have the former kind of marketplace where there's not just perfect substitution and everyone is switching between each service depending on price. And so if you can do something with, I think this is like actually a very big and important insight about marketplaces that most people miss. And if you can do something where people can only list their space on your marketplace because you're going to have around the clock instant booking or something, uh, that would be really important to figure out early, and a very valuable tweak that doesn't sound that doesn't sound that big, but is actually a huge difference to the long-term viability of the business. Uh, I think that's a that's a good um, take on it. Um, so right now, as far as the 24-hour booking and whatnot, I want to give the property owners or homeowners, the ability to set their own times. Sure. So sometimes maybe some owners or property owners say, we'll just say like uh, Wells Fargo. They can right. obviously set theirs a little bit later after business hours is closed. Oh, do you think that you'll be able to get businesses to give up their parking spots I would love well? to reach out to businesses to give up their parking spots as well. Because I, I was thinking that this is more around homeowners or people who have ex extra spaces on their own. But businesses could be really interesting. It's a very different sale now because now you really have to go and convince whoever the property manager is or somebody else to actually correct, do it. Correct. Correct. 
I would, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, just one thought here, which is I would f pick one of them in the beginning because yeah. you won't be able to sell to both. Yeah. So I, I essentially wanted to focus on poss possibly like residential and private lots first and then start slowly building out. Do you have any sense yet for pricing? Yes. Um, so <laughs> I pretty much wanted to model this after the meters in San Francisco. And right now the meters are all timed. Uh, SF Park actually did a survey in which they increased meter pricing. So similar to variable based pricing. So this, that's what we're going to pretty much mimic. Um, essentially, we want to be, be competing with the meters themselves for residential. Um, for private lots, obviously, we're going to be competing with private lot prices. So we're just going to base our model off of the model that San Francisco has already done. <laughs> And people will be able to park, I assume, as long as they want, as long as they want and the property owner is. As long as the property owners set their times to say eight to five, they could park eight to five and it'll be on an hourly rate. What's the legal situation of this? I assume it's okay if it's It is legal. Property. It is completely legal. Um, okay. I've looked into it. I've talked to uh, an SF law attorney uh, specifically for San Francisco themselves and I've asked them, um, can I, it's kind of a funny question. Yeah. <laughs> the story goes is uh, I, I called them up. I said, hey, my... Uh, my dad is uh, bedridden, but he, he's not able to work. He doesn't get enough from Social Security. And um, essentially, he needs uh, to make some passive income. Is it okay if we could rent this space out to our neighbor? And they said, uh, as long as it's his house, we don't see any issue with it. Great. So That's great. Um, this is, again, this is a really good idea. Uh, if you don't move fast, it won't work. So I, I think it's always important as a startup to know what the number one biggest problem in front of you is. For you, it's like not shipping quickly. And so just get this working in one neighborhood as quickly as you possibly can, even if it's like hacked up and doesn't look that great. Okay. Any other questions you want to discuss? Um, I think that's it. I'm great. Pretty good. I'm excited right. to try it out. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Email us when you launch. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. How's it going? Yuri. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi. Yuri, nice to meet you. Hi. What do you guys do? So I'm Philip. I'm Emma, um, and we're Moonlight Work. So we're building a marketplace for software engineers and designers to match up with companies who need them 10 hours at a time. So specifically 10 hours at a time? Yeah, I think we'll start with 10 hours at a time, but some companies want more than that, and some people want more work. So if they want more time, they can have more time. Are you, oh, cool. <laughs> is this launched up and running? Um, we have a prototype up and running. We haven't had anybody else use it, but both of us have both. Built projects for yeah. other people. That's mm -hmm. a great way to start. Yes. That's good. So we use we started it because we have this need ourselves. What so do kinda... companies find you? Uh, there's been a variety of them. Some of them have been like friends of friends that heard that we were doing contract work and would come in and like assign jobs through there. Another thing is when we shut down our last company, we open sourced all the code. And so we had people coming in and like paying us to deploy that code for them on their own servers. They found us through GitHub, basically. What nice. kind of projects are people having you build so far? Um, so far, it's a lot of people who have a very specific need. So they're like, I need an expert in this language or an expert that knows how to build this thing really well. And so they're looking for someone who there's not going to be much onboarding. They're just going to be able to jump in and do a project. Why do they choose you instead of something like Upwork or Tautel or one of the other kind of outsourcing houses? Yeah, I think the biggest reason is because we're... Um, promoting it as something that experts are working on. Mm. So these aren't just anyone in the world who wants to make $15 an hour. This is someone who maybe works at a Google or an Uber, and they want to make a bunch of extra money on the side, but they're really good at what they do. So you're going to have to actually curate these people then. Mm. Is that yeah. something you're already doing? Um, yeah, that's, our, that's what we're starting to do, and I think that's going to be the biggest barrier for us, is being able to make sure that these people are really quality workers. How much are you charging for a 10-hour project? So the contractors set their own rates, and then we're handling the invoicing and charging 15% on top of that. So, but true marketplace, you... Correct. Yeah. yeah. Other than quality, uh, given that so many people, like, this is clearly a good business, so a lot of people want it, and a lot of people are already in it. How will you get, <laughs> how, how will you become the marketplace where everyone goes for contracted engineering help? I think we can speak from our own experience and say like there have been times in the past when we had like student loans and would have worked extra time every week to pay them off. And there's not really marketplaces out there where people who want over 50 or $70 per hour can find 
like short-term projects that they can do on the side. So that, that's true on the developer side, but how do you get the companies to come to you and say, when we need an expert, we go to you guys? We're working on a couple different ways of matching, but I think the short of it is that there are very specialized needs that some companies have, and it doesn't even have to be core to the product. Sometimes it's like, I need to set up a development environment, or I want a landing page, and our design team is focused on an app, or something like that. I wonder if you want to become known as the, like, the place to go to for a particular set of skills. Not for every expertise, but in the beginning, just like a particular set where they just go to you, and then you open up additional verticals as you go. And for that, we're looking at open source projects. So like an open source project is something where it takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience to kind of understand the ins and the outs. And so we tested that with our own open source projects and got projects coming through there and people signing up. And I think that matching people based on very specific open source projects, not saying like, you know, a Ruby programming language, but something like the MongoDB bindings right. for Chef for something very specific like that. I, I think the 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 insight of going after high end like high end work and also for people who are just looking for smaller pieces is is really good. I wonder if you could pick projects that particularly need that, like projects that are harder to build and take less time, mm -hmm. sort of need specialized skills and are not the normal, like, I just need people to grind through this. That would strike me as a good initial focus. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest problem in front of the company right now? Um, I think it's making sure that matching, I mean, obviously every marketplace has that issue, but making sure that the people we have are worth what they're trying to get charged for. Because um, we want to set a limit on how much people can charge per hour. So Why? we want to have a higher, we want people that are, yeah, minimum, sorry. Oh. So we want people who are making more money per hour because that's going to bump up the quality of the right. work. How much do you believe. two charge per hour? Um, we're both trying to charge about 150 an hour. And, and that, we're, we're finding, so we've had about 300 people sign up so far, and we asked them what their hourly rate is, and it's usually from about 70 to 200 per hour. The, the interesting thing is that it's not so much how much the people are charging, it's more the perceived value on the other companies, right? Mm -hmm. So if the companies think that these developers are worth the 150 or $200 an hour, they don't actually, like, they, they're happy to pay that, but you need to convince them that they're worth that money, regardless of what the developers think they're worth. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you do that? How do you convince a company that your developers are worth $200 an hour if they can go somewhere for $25 an hour? Yeah, and I think right now for the MVP, what we're trying to say is like we are personally experts in these fields and we are making sure that the quality of talent we have is up to that par. Um, I think that we need to figure out how we're going to scale that. I, I also think in addition to figuring out how to scale it, you need to figure out how you're going to communicate it. Like mm -hmm. the website yeah. really has to give across the impression with testimonials from well-known customers or whatever that like mm -hmm. these are the best people. Um, in terms of setting the prices, one thing we have consistently seen is when you ask a user to set the, their price or something in the marketplace, if you give them guidance, if you say like based off what you've said, here's what you recommend or here's the range you recommend, 85, 90% of users will do that. And so if you want to set if you want to sort of move people towards a specific range because you want people that are at that quality level, um, you can probably do that. So we did that. It, our sign-up form says the average hourly rate is seventy dollars per hour, and it also says uh, if you have your monthly or sorry, if you have your annual annual salary, that's about what your hourly rate is. It's like a hundred dollars per hour is about fifty dollars. Sorry, a hundred thousand dollars per year is about fifty dollars per hour. When do you think you'll have the first? Uh, external developer live, right? So that's not the two of you. Mm -hmm. So we're working on basically building out invoicing right now. And so that'll be the next week or two, probably. Do you need invoice? Like, can you do it more manually in the beginning? It, just so that you can see someone who's not you. Because you obviously don't have invoicing, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this ourselves, and there's just a lot of moving parts. There's like sending contracts back and forth. There's like setting up bank accounts, there's getting companies to pay. And when we talk to the potential contractors who want to be on the platform, some of their biggest concerns are, like, if I'm only working 10 hours per week, how much time does it take to ramp up? Like, do I need to talk with the customer? And how long does it take until I get paid? And yeah, but also I, not the I, would, I would try and hack all of that away and just do, like, do it behind the scenes manually right now just to get the, peop the developers developing. Take all of the pressure away from them so that they can just start interacting with the customer. And if you need to manually process it, do that. But like, it's so important that someone who's not you starts doing this on your platform. Mm -hmm. and, and then when they do, for the first ones especially, I would like be super involved right. just to learn what the issues are. Like, it may be that people 
aren't sure they're allowed to do this and they need help like looking at their current employment contracts. It may be that people need training to know how to like engage with a customer and like how much they should communicate. There are all of these things, uh, many of which will surprise you and your guesses on many will be wrong. And the way you find this out is to just like, for the first, let's say 20 users, like go sit with them or at least go talk to them all the time. I would almost think about it like become their agent, right? Like if they were a talent and you were an agent for them and you take care of everything for them and answer all their questions. And then you can just start building that into the product. But uh, in our experience, almost every time when the people think they know like where the breakpoints are going to be or what they need to teach their users, um, they're almost always wrong. But you find it out really quickly. It's like you don't need a giant sample set to start hearing the common <coughs> concerns people have at every, every stage in the process. And then you just knock those off one at a time. And that is a way I think you can differentiate from other coding talent marketplaces that don't do this. Um, and if you can figure out, like, if you can be the person that makes it so that people who want a little extra income but don't know how to go be a freelancer <laughs> learn and if that becomes your reputation that'll be a great way to like get the top talent in, in the field one of the other just an idea which you may or may not want to pursue but if you want to be known as the experts in the field see if you can get any experts to actually use your platform right through your network or somewhere else where get someone who's well known on a particular niche area and have them sign up on your platform and do projects on your platform if they're willing to yeah so what's what's your biggest problem right now us personally, or the company. The company. <laughs> yeah. In this stage, it's one. In, in this stage, it's often one and the same. Yeah. Um. I think it's more just like getting the machinery up. Um, as we're like, if we were to manually take payments, my biggest concern would be that ten months down the line, I'm gonna have to manually calculate ten ninety nine. Oh, but you're not like gonna that. be ten months down the line. Yeah. You really, you need I, to get to like yeah. the next two months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say to go along with that, the reason we feel like we have to have some sort of payment thing set up is because there's so many laws around how you can pay people and like kind of the logistics of all of that and sure. paperwork that needs to be gone through. So I think you're right. We need to do those first couple ones to know what those are. Um, but I think we're both like is there not of doing just that. some other startup that you can use that handles invoicing really well? Well, it is you, complicated. So you're, you're right. Or just like an accountant that can help you. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. So we're using Stripe Connect, yeah. which handles everything, including like the 1099s. But there's no like turnkey invoicing system built on top of that right now. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I really do get that. But I still feel like it's so, so I, I get that feeling as a developer all the time, where it's like, if only I have this built, I'd, I'd be ready to go. But it's so much more important to actually find out if you can, like, even if you have the platform built, there's a chance that people won't start using it. And you'll only know that when you do the non-scalable things. That's one of the things that we drive home almost every single office hour session, which is just do the non-scalable things. Do it manually. Don't worry about 10 months down the road. The, the, 10 months down the road, it's a new company. Right? Like it will look very different than it is today. But today, it's so important to just do the non-scalable things. And we're just talking about a small handful of users. Like you don't have yeah. to bring on. Everyone's like, well, my problem is that if I do this non-scalable thing, 2,000 users will sign up tomorrow. You should be so lucky. I don't have to deal with them. And that is not what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, the, it's, a war, it's a slightly worrying instinct to say that like, my biggest problem is that I haven't built this one piece of the software yet. Not, not that my biggest problem is how I'm going to get those 2,000 users. So what we're focusing on basically is the invoicing right now. Like it's not people logging in or yeah. anything like that. It's just like being able to take a credit card or yeah. bank account details right now. OK, well, again, if that's the one thing you want to do, I would get that. If you think you'll have it live in a week. Go like, if I, what I was, my, my answer to that question um, about your biggest problem would, would I, I'm not worried about the fact that you'll be able to get people that need developers to build something. There's a lot of people that have an idea for an app, you know. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that I worry about is everyone, so, so often we've seen the idea of, I'm going to get these great developers to sort of, you know, build stuff for other people. And it has been so hard to actually do that because the, peop the reasons that people have thought they're going to get the developers or the, the, the sort of assumptions in, developers know how to do this well have just been so wrong. And so you still don't have like, you won't notice your own problems because you've thought about this a lot. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I think like, it, 
you may find out that invoicing doesn't even need to be built the way you think it needs to be built mm -hmm. um, because there's something fundamental about the model that's going to change. But getting people you don't know or you don't know well to sort of build projects on the platform, I think that, that should, that's a really important step. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I would just add in that the idea came from a prior company where we didn't have the That's time great. to go hire people, and we started hiring part-time people, people who were like friends of friends, things like that. And so we started to do a lot of like first-hand research like that. No, I, I, I think that's great. That's actually super important because it means you have the pain and you understand the pain. But it's still like, it, Sam and I are just kind of driving to the same thing, which is just, it's so critical to get someone who has nothing to do with your previous business or your current kind of core business yeah. that wants to start using it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Any other issues you'd like to talk about? Any other questions? I don't think so. I think that that's our main thing that we know we need to do right now. Great. That's super exciting. And how, did, how did you decide about 15% as the amount to charge? Um, I think that's another thing we need to test out. But we feel like that's a number that's not crazy for businesses to pay on top of something. Um, like my roommate's a recruiter, and she pays she gets 30% off of the top of all of their salaries. Um, but it's also enough for us to not have too many people to start with and be able to start testing things out. Is that a price that you're going, going to charge on top of the hourly rate, or is that just going to be blended into yeah, the hourly so rate? Yeah, so if somebody's $70 an hour, we'll add $15 to that. Or, sorry, $100 yeah. an hour, we'll add $15 right. to that. And this is you know, a good problem to have in the future. What will prevent people from, once they work with someone they like, just hiring them off the platform and not... I think that's another thing that um, a lot of developers and designers have pointed out to us. And I think we want to make sure that the tools inside of the platform are keeping people there. So it's so easy for them to get work and keep work, and they can do this on the side. Um, so building internal tools that allow people to work remotely and as contract workers yeah. will be another thing. That's that we another thing that on. works well about the short term projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Very cool. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so format-wise, that was an experiment. Is that something you'd like us to do more of in the class? Was that useful? More regular lectures? Yes. Yes. Some middle. Okay. We'll do some more about that. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. from the product hunt launch. That's great. Yeah. How much are you charging? Um, it's a range. So um, on the low end, we have like a $2 plan, which was our our alternative to freemium. Um, GPM. And, uh, and it goes from 1949, 129 from there. Um, and we're really, it's really early, and we're trying to iterate on this and figure out what our best price point is, which is probably one of our main challenges right now, I think. Is, oh, go ahead. No, no. How'd you even arrive at the first set of numbers to test? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The two dollar one was kind of special. We were flip flopping between freemium and GPM. And I think that was a good decision because it narrowed down um, our potential customers by a lot. And um, we figured that people who are not going to pay us anything. We're never going to pay us anything. Um, How many of the 25 customers are on the $2 plan? Um, maybe seven. Yeah. That's a good really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, and what's the other most popular plan? It's at 19? 19. 19. Um, we limited our $2 plan very heavily. So it's really people who like are a solo founder, you probably no revenue. Yeah. How do you decide, what, what do you get with the pricing? I think I looked at your website, it's how many users you have? Right, so right now we're charging by how many end users you have. Um, that was kind of our proxy to how much value the company was going to get from our product. Um, this is kind of a challenge, um, especially because we can't particularly tell how many users they have. Um, so we're iterating on this as well. What do people really love about this? Why do, why do they use your product and not one of the many other services to accomplish the same goal? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different Good afternoon. So today we're going to do something different. Uh, one of the things that we've learned at Y Combinator is that one of the best ways to learn about startups is to watch other startups get advice. Um, and so we're going to do live office hours, which we've done a few times before in this class, three or four times. Uh, we'll try to do three companies each time. This is Yuri, also works at Y Combinator, uh, and going to do this with me. And we're going to just give advice to three startups. You have to be very brave to do this. So I'm very thankful for the startups that have agreed to do this. Uh, these are some of the people that are taking the course online. Um, and we'll just get going.
Uh, so do you want to tell us? Well, first you want to introduce yourselves. Yes. Does this work? Oh. Yeah. So I'm Sarah, and this is my co-founder, Andrew. Um, we're building Canny. Uh, Canny helps teams collect and manage feedback from their users. Um, essentially what it is, is teams can integrate our product into their website or mobile app, and that allows their users to post and vote on feedback. Is it live? It is yes. Live. And how, so, many, oh, how many websites uh, have integrated? Yeah, um, we launched our MVP about a month ago on Product Hunt, um, and that was pretty good traffic. Um, we have uh, 25 paying customers, so those are people who have um, either integrated or using us in a certain way. Um, but yeah, we got maybe around 500 companies. Um, if so, well, I guess, do you, do you think you're at that point first? Yeah, I feel like we have a sliver of product market fit where some people are extremely happy with our product, and we kind of know the next steps we need to do to expand that by 10x to you know, address a larger portion of the market. What are the steps? Uh, integrations with other SaaS services like Intercom, Slap, Z uh, Slack, Zapier, and then uh, a better uh, answer on mobile. Is that the biggest? Is the biggest challenge you face now just figuring out how to grow and scale this? Do you think, or is there still a lot of product work? Uh, other than sort of like integrations that are meant to drive growth, is there still a lot of product work before you really want to scale? There's a there's some product work for sure. I think the core product is pretty good, but it takes a while for our our leads to get stuck on our product because they have to integrate into their product, so it's a pretty big investment. How um, easy is it to integrate again? It's pretty easy. It's, it's like really easy. You know, it takes half an hour to an hour is what we see developers spending time on. But uh, it's just, I think we need better onboarding to convince them that this is worth doing. And so like, I think right now our funnel is pretty leaky. Hmm. Um, so that's what we're well, working on onboarding. What's the biggest value? That, so your biggest user has a, 300 questions? Or a couple Post. of hundred questions? Post. Post. Several hundred. Yeah, right. And so what's the biggest value that they see out of it? What did they tell you? Yeah, it's hard because a lot of like our, our value add is very diverse. Like one thing is customer satisfaction. Another thing is product management. You know what you want to work on. Another thing is having a transparent roadmap, so keeping your users in the loop. And there's just all these different kind of values. There isn't one core value, which is also why it's kind of hard to. That sounds like a mistake. A mistake. Uh, almost everyone who says, "Oh, we have all these different values," and you know, like there's all these different reasons people like it. It's really nice if you can figure out how that all abstracts into one message and then build all of the company's sales and marketing and PR around one this message. Is core value the, this is what it's about, uh, right. rather than saying, oh, there's like six different reasons to use the product. I think one of the things that like, so, so when you say you have a problem with people integrating you, it's not that hard. It's just not high enough on their priority list. And there's a few ways to solve this. One thing that works is to send people around and say like, hey, we're going to send an engineer to come help integrate with you. And it's not that the company can't do it. It's just that like, you otherwise you'll always be at the bottom of their backlog. Right. And that's one way. The other is if it's like their CEO tells them to go do it, right. um, or like right. they themselves <laughs> decide, I got to go do this. It's really important. And that almost never comes from a bunch of disparate messages that are a bunch of nice to haves. It's like one thing, which is maybe in this case like, um, I mean, it's, it's some version of like user feedback and how if you don't have this, you will be iterating more slowly than your competitors. Or um, that your users will feel like you're more engaged with them, if listening to the features that they want built. I have two big questions. Um, one, I, I think back of the envelope math is always really important. And I think I worry that this is the kind of business where if you're mostly selling to startups, and you're selling values that you get out of posting and voting on features. One of them is, you know, you you have a there's a lot of transparency, so you keep your users in the loop. Um, a lot of current feedback solutions is like email or live chat, where you you the user sends an email and then the company says, oh, we'll pass it on to the team is what inevitably happens, and then uh, the user doesn't really know like did my voice get heard, and so we've heard both from teams and users that this is a great experience. Their users are happy. They know what feedback their users are giving versus email and live chat, which takes just a ton of time to process all these conversations. Of the people that are using it, what's, kinda the, what's the average number of questions that have been posted on it so far? Average number of questions? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so people put, or requests or something else that they're voting on. Like, Do you know, of, of the 25 paying customers, how many on average have had questions posted? It really depends on how many end users they have, and right. also how um, well they've implemented um, our tools. Like, if it's less discoverable, they're going to get less feedback. And so we've been trying to um, help that by giving them design advice. Um, 
but um, like our top team probably has 300 posts. Um, and the thing about e this versus email is that you might get, you know, if a post has 100 votes, you might get 100 different emails. Right. And so we help you like save time by responding to all those 100 people at once instead of like sending um, individual emails back and forth. Do, do you feel like you've gotten to the point where you have a product that some people really love and at this point 